I'm Maureen Cole, the Lewisboro Town Historian, and today we're going to talk about some Lewisboro ladies, ladies who have uh, made a little bit of history in our town. Um, I did this, sh this uh, program at the library earlier this spring, but uh, we did not have a chance to tape it, so uh, today I'm going to bring you some of that wonderful entertainment we did a few months ago. Earlier this spring, we did this show at the Lewisboro Library, but did not have a chance to tape it. So uh, today, we're going to talk about eight ladies who've made Lewisboro history. And here we have them. Uh, each of them has so much about themselves that I have to tell you that I'm afraid I'm going to read from some notes, which I don't usually do. Uh, I'm going to talk about eight ladies. Seven of them were born in the 19th century. One of them was born in the 20th century. But they all uh, contributed much to our Lewisboro history. Two of them even had national, uh, national renown. So we will get to these ladies in mostly in chronological order. However, I am going to start with maybe the most important lady to where we are today. And that is Alice Lane Poor. She was born in 1885, and she died in 1981. Another thing I can say about most of these ladies is that they lived a long life. So, we will start with Alice Poor because we happen to be sitting in what was the music room and the library of her home, which we all know and love as Honortrue Farm. Alice Lane Poor uh, was as I said, born in 1885. She was born in Orange, New Jersey, East Orange, New Jersey, that is, and to Edward B. Lane, who was um, the first person to come. He was the one that bought Honor True Farm back in 1900. Edward Lane and his wife, Grace, had two children, Grace being the older, and Walter, um, her brother, whoops, but her brother didn't show much interest in the farm, and so when uh, Grace's father, when, I'm sorry, when Alice's father died, Alice took over the farm, and that was about 1924 when her father passed away. Her father was a fairly wealthy man. He made most of his money, he made his money in uh, importing guano from South America. Now, it might be a you wonder how that could could uh, bring a lot of money to someone, but guano, guano from seagulls and various birds was made into fertilizer, which was very important to the farming industry in America. Alice attended the Brearley School in Manhattan and basically lived in Manhattan most of her life. The farm at first uh, was a gentleman's farm. It was for weekends and summers. Uh, and it was a working dairy farm. Her father used it as a working dairy farm until he died in 1924. In the, in the 1940s, the Poors came here, Alice and, her, and uh, her husband, Walter, and their two children, Grace and Walter, moved to the farm uh, permanently. Before that, as I said, it had been a summer and, and uh, vacation home. They continued the farming. It never stopped being a farm. It just, as Alice took over, uh, it became more a self-sustaining farm for the family. Although they did have a, uh, a dairy, they produced butter, they produced milk, they produced goat's milk, and some of these products were sold in Ridgefield to the various restaurants. In fact, uh, there is a bottle, a milk bottle from that says, on a true farm, goat's milk, Ridgefield, Connecticut, which makes people very confused because the historians in Ridgefield had never heard of on a true farm. They came to me saying, do I know anything about on a true farm? And I had to explain to them that on a true farm was in Lewisboro, but back in, actually until the 1970s, this area of Lewisboro had Ridgefield addresses and New Canaan addresses. So 
there is a lot of confusion of people living in this Lewisboro area and in parts of South Salem being known as Ridgefield because when historians are looking up uh, addresses, this is known as Ridgefield. It's not Ridgefield, never was, well, but it's, it's Lewisboro. In the early 1940s is when Alice and her, hus her husband Walter came to the farm permanently. Uh, Alice really loved the farm. Her husband was more of a city boy, but he, uh, he, t he took on his farm chores with pleasure. And well, actually, not too many of the farm chores, more the business, the business area. Uh, Alice studied farming practices through the Cornell Extension courses. She studied crop rotation. She studied the best ways of animal husbandry. And uh, she was a very progressive person. She also had, we'll just get away from the farming for a minute. She also uh, was known around town for her automobile. She had a white steamer, which was kind of similar to a Stanley steamer, but it was produced by the White Company. And one Fourth of July, she was driving it in the Ridgefield Fourth of July parade, and uh, she crashed it in the middle of the parade, which caused a little bit of concern and a lot of steam. But it didn't stop her driving, and uh, she progressed through the years, getting a little better at, uh, at her driving skills. Now, just a listing of some of her activities. Farming and gardening, we mentioned. Uh, Rich, she was instrumental in starting the Lewisboro Garden Club. She was a member in very good standing of the Ridgefield Garden Club. Politics. She was a lifelong Republican. She was head of the town Republican committee at one point and was on that committee forever. She was very active in the Red Cross, teaching first aid classes during World War II. She was in charge of the first aid club. Um, and also her daughter Grace was part of those classes. We had an incredible effort during World War II throughout the town. Uh, raising money, raising war bonds, raising money to buy airplanes, uh, to uh, uh, do recycling, recycling efforts. And we'll hear more about that on when, when I talk about one of the other women. But uh, her main, her main uh, ac activity during World War II was with the Red Cross. Church. She was an active member of St. Paul, St. John's Episcopal Parish. She was the church organist down at St. Paul's Chapel, and her son Walter remembers with perhaps fondness of having to keep the organ pump going while his mother played, and that was his job as a teenager. She was in the church choir. Uh, education. She was very much in favor of advancing public education, and she was one of the members of the Lewis Fund. The Lewis Fund was the uh, fund that John Lewis, our namesake, had set up back in 1840. That money, some of it still survives today, and a little bit of that money each year goes to the, South, to the Lewisboro Library. But back in Grace's day, in Alice's day, it was divided amongst the, the um, the Lewisboro one-room schoolhouses, and she was in charge of seeing that the, oh, and, and when Lewisboro School was formed, seeing that the monies were, were spent according to John Lewis's will. She was a very active member of the District Nurses Association for the Vista Lewisboro area. She, as I mentioned before, was very active in World War II. She was on the War Council. And her husband, Walter, was head of the Lewisboro Observation Post. If you don't know what the Lewisboro Observation Post was, it was a, a tower, a water tower, area, a, a tower located on a farm at the southern end of Elmwood, Elmwood Road. And people would spend three hour shifts, 24 hours a day, looking for enemy planes. They would keep track of every plane, which there weren't all that many, and never an enemy plane spied. So in any case, the observation post kept us safe from any German infringements on, on our town. Uh, she also was a, 
philanthropist. Not only uh, did she give honor to farm to the town in three different parcels, she gave the land across the street from the farmhouse as a reservation for scouting activities, for camping activities, uh, and, and also for, trail, for trailing, for uh, hiking on the trails. Then she gave an area behind the immediate farmhouse as a, it's a lovely pine grove, again filled with hiking opportunities. And lastly, in the late 1970s, she gave the final portion, which included this farmhouse and the buildings around it. So in all, about 100 acres were given to the town because, as Alice said, I want to keep the town rural. I want to give my property to the town to preserve the rural atmosphere. And that she certainly did. She was not averse to having the land developed, and that is why we have the soccer, the tennis, uh, and uh, playing fields for the children. Uh, to get back to uh, her philanthropy activities, she was very, very uh, gracious or very, very supportive of the Vista Fire Department. She was a big contributor to them, and she, bought, she gave them the money for their ambulance. So uh, the Vista Fire Department, in fact, gave her a plaque in recognition of, of her support, and it's right in the circle behind the farmhouse. So you can take a turn. If you come to the house someday, just stop a little bit by, by the back door, and uh, you'll see the plaque the fire department gave to Alice in, in thanks for her, for her donations. Um, a little bit, just a little bit aside about Alice's husband, because uh, he was responsible for all the pine trees that are planted, well, were planted across the street until Hurricane Sandy took a bunch of them down. But in the reserve across the street, along the, behind the stone wall, were, were a, marching, a, a line of marchers of pine trees. In fact, Walter Jr. called, uh, he said, we were like Hitler's army carrying buckets to uh, preserve these pine trees when they were first planted because, of course, they were just seedlings. And, and the kids were the ones in charge of keeping them watered. They did a good job because they lasted from the 19, early 19, well, the 1930s until, until Sandy came by. Um, I think that kind of sums up Alice in as well as we can by saying she was a philanthropist, she was a farmer, she was a mother, she was a grandmother, uh, she was a wife and uh, uh, love the town of Lewisboro. Ah, now we're on to our second Lewisboro lady, and we're going to go back uh, about 100 years. We're going back to 1801 and the birth of Belinda Wilson Coles in Golden's Bridge. Belinda Wilson Coles was a minister's wife, a, uh, a Methodist minister's wife. She was born, as I said, in 1801 in Golden's Bridge. She died in 1884. Uh, up in Putnam County. She had a fairly uh, full life. She married George Coles, a minister, a minister from England, when she was about 19 years old. He was a, a, a circuit minister, and on his circuit he had happened to pass through Golden's Bridge. And since uh, the, the Wilson family was a staunch Methodist family, he must have stayed with the family. Anyway, in some, somehow Belinda uh, came to meet George, although he was 10 years older than she was, and they were married. Uh, for the first couple of years of their marriage, they lived in Golden's Bridge with the Wilson family. Uh, George, being a circuit itinerant clergyman, never stayed in the same place for too long. Uh, they had six, seven children, and uh, just think of this, in the early 1800s, with no, really no help, Belinda was had to do the, uh, the chores of a minister's wife, raised seven kids, uh, and also had to move a lot. And I just, just to go over, she had uh, 
children, she had Sarah in 1821 in South Salem. Then they moved to Hudson. She had Electra. Then that was every two years, actually. In 1825, Mary Frances in Rhinebeck. 1831, Hester Emma. 1833, Phoeba Anna in New York City. Hester was born in Hartford. Then they were in New York City. And then they were back in Hartford in 1836 for George Jr. And lastly, in 1838, back in New York City, and they had James Alfred. So she had seven children to take care of. But the Coles family, and I'm going to read from a little bit from a biography done by Shirley Porter, who was a friend of mine in Yorktown and a Methodist historian. Shirley said, the Coles family became adept at picking up their constantly growing household and moving up and down the Hudson Valley every two years. Sometimes they traveled by Hudson River Sloop, sometimes by horse and wagon with their three trunks piled high around them. The life of a circuit preacher meant he was a traveling man. George Coles wrote in his journal that one year he traveled 2,400 miles, preached 103 times in the city, 123 times in the country, and slept in 40 different beds. Much of this time, Belinda was at home with her rapidly increasing brood. Um, Mrs. Porter's history indicates the family was often in debt, possibly because Reverend Coles was always buying books and new clothes. He doesn't mention too much of Mrs. Coles ever having to buy or getting a new gown. Often she had to rely on her family back in Golden's Bridge for food and financial help. However, he does refer to her in several different ways. He calls her my beloved companion, my helpmate, my other self, my dear wife, ma, mother, wife, and sister. Most of his family was left in England, so he was the only fam only other uh, fam this was the only other family he ever had. Um, most of the time, though, he refers to her as Mrs. Coles, and she refers to him as Mr. Coles. Seems strange nowadays, but that's the way it was back in the 1800s. Um, she had a sister that she wrote to quite often, and this is. This is how, uh, this kind of sums up her philosophy of life. I fear sometimes that my children occupy too much of my thoughts, but I believe it requires great judgment to know how much of a mother's time should be spent in order to make her children comfortable. But I am sensible that the duty devolves upon me as a mother, and it is very great. And the only way I can perform it is with the help of the Lord. Belinda died, as I said, in, um, um, actually, I think she died in Purdy's uh, in 18, 1884. But I did forget to mention, not only did she raise all those children, mostly by herself, her husband was kind of a hypochondriac or a semi-invalid. He had a heart condition, and um, in one of his junctures in New York City, he contracted malaria. So she not only was taking care of her children, she was nursing her husband. Now we're going to uh, travel from uh, the 19th century. We're going to cross over from the 19th into the 20th century. And this is in the personage of our third lady, uh, Elizabeth Lawrence Black. Bailey. The name Bailey should be familiar to some people if you've read any of the history book. Uh, certainly where the Baileys, her husband was Pierce Bailey. He was a psychi psychiatrist. And uh, does the name Four Winds mean anything to you? Because Pierce Bailey and Edith Lawrence Bailey were the, were the owners and the builders of Four Winds. That was the name of their estate. Later on, it was turned into what we know today as Four Winds uh, Hospital. You don't hear too much about Edith Bailey. There's not a whole lot written about her. She was born in 1869. She died in 1912. She was, of all the women I'm going to talk about, the one with the shortest, uh, the shortest life. She died at the age of 43 from uh, diabetes. 
back in the early 1900s, diabetes was a dread disease and it was a disease there really was no cure for. So when she died, uh, she, had, she lived a quite a full life in those 40 years. Uh, she was a writer, a poet, a dramatist, an early supporter of suffrage, of the suffrage movement, and um, uh, quite an active suffragette in the New York City, the New York City area. Uh, she married Pierce Bailey in 1900, and they had four children. When she died, uh, she left Edith, age nine, Pierce, age eight, James, age eight. They possibly were twins. There's no mention of that, but they were both the same age. And also Geraldine, a baby of two months. So you think of that in the process where she was nearing death, she also had given birth to, a, to a, an infant. Uh, she also attended the Brearley School in Manhattan, the same one that um, Alice Poor did uh, about 20, 30 years later. She was born in New Jersey to a Quaker family, and uh, they came to Cross River, the, the Baileys came to Cross River about 1900, and as I said, they built the, the place that became known as four winds. Um, and just a little bit about how four winds got its name. And this is a quote from um, Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 9 to 12 in the Old Testament. From the four winds come, O spirit, and breathe into those slain that they may come to life. And the spirit came into them. They came alive and stood upright, a vast army. So from the four winds came the spirits to the battlefield, and that's how four winds got its name. If you want the complete reading, see chapter 37 of the prophet Ezekiel. Um, now, she, as I said, was a very active suffragette. She was a member of the Equal Franchise League in New York City. She took part in suffragette suffrage marches in New York City, and she also spoke at Carnegie Hall. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit from her speech at Carnegie Hall. She saw things in the world and society that needed change, and even though she had a very short life and she was a, quite a young woman, she worked hard to see that some change could come about. She worked in the tenement houses in New York City, uh, and as I said, she was uh, very active in supporting the suffragettes, even holding uh, meetings and, and rallies at Four Winds, at, Four Winds her, at her estate. Uh, she considered Four Winds a meeting place for all, and it certainly was. Uh, she was, had a stimulating personality, according to things written about her. She had a spontaneous wit, but it wasn't cruel and demeaning. Uh, she worked hard for the enfranchisement of women. She could entertain controversial subjects without rancor. She had a brilliant intellect, and she was penetrating, penetrating thoughts and a vigorous person. However, she had a gentle, feminine manner. She really, from all I've said about her, you wouldn't think the next, the next adjectives would be, she had a shy reserve and was courageous. At her, uh, at her funeral service, the editor of the North County Katona paper said, she had the mind of a man, the heart of a woman, and the enthusiasm of a saint. Now, I just wanted to read from uh, a couple of the uh, things that she did as uh, supporting the enfranchisement of women movement. After a trip to England in January of 1910, Edith came back and told everybody what they were doing in England where they were a little bit ahead of the ladies in the United States. They hold meetings in large and small halls and on street corners almost daily. Their sandwich women, meaning the women who wore sandwich boards in the parade, parade the streets. Can we no longer avoid this issue? Is it not a question of women's suffrage? Isn't it a moral one? Once sow the seed of moral responsibility and there will be no rest for womanhood till the question is threshed out. In November of 1910, she addressed a suffrage gathering at Carnegie Hall that included a childhood friend, Senator George Agnew, who also lived uh, right down the street from her on Route 35 in South Salem. 
he strongly, he was a New York State Senator and he strongly opposed the suffrage movement, as did most of the New York State Senators. And this is Edith uh, looking straight at Senator Agnew. Over 3,000 years ago, there was a celebrated promoter who prepared a set of rules for the conduct of the world in which there was very little said about women. If there had been a Mrs. Moses on hand at the time, perhaps things would have been arranged differently. Let us have an 11th commandment, commandment gentlemen. Give the women a fair deal. Now, I'm going to uh, uh, just conclude Mrs. Pierce Bailey, who died peacefully at home uh, in Cross River on September 7th in 1912. And at her at her uh, wake, at her service, uh, a great many friends were assembled from far and near to do honor to her memory. The burial was in the little village graveyard, which is the Cross River Cemetery. And at that point, you could see from Four Winds over to where she was buried in Cross River. Small of body and with no great power of voice, it was given her to hold the largest public gathering by a spell of impish wit and a sense of humor that was at once fine and broad, a stirring satirist of the cause. You have probably uh, noticed across from the five, um, the, the, uh, where 121 and 35 meet across from 5th Division Market, a fountain. That fountain was placed there by Pierce Bailey in honor of, her wife, of his wife. And on the fountain, if you go up closely, it reads, Spirits of water, earth, and sky all gather here, where once dwelt one who, like the spring, was sparkling, sweet, and clear. When you have a moment, rest, stop, and take a rest at the monument honoring Elizabeth Lawrence Bailey. Now, we will go on to the uh, final lady we're going to talk about today, and this is Louise Boughton. She was born in South Salem in 1881. She lived to be 104 years old. She died in 1985. Louise Boughton, traces her roots back to the very beginning founding families of South Salem. Uh, she is descended from the Cap Captain Moses Boughton, who was uh, a soldier in the Revolutionary War. Her father was Aaron Boughton, her mother was Sarah Louise Boughton, and she was born uh, across the street, actually, from the Boughton Homestead, which is a big white farmhouse about two doors down from the old Lewisboro School on Boughton Road, going toward Route 35. Uh, Louis, Louise Boughton grew up on the farm. It was an active farm then. It covered a lot of uh, the Boughton Road area on both sides of the street. She remembers chasing turkeys at night. Her job at night on the farm as a youngster, uh, probably a nine or 10 year old, was to chase all the turkeys back into the barn at night. Chickens go into the barn, turkeys don't go in without a little help. She also remembers uh, visits of the leather man to their house. The leather man was an itinerant wanderer in the 1850s to the 18, 1880s, and he followed a 360 mile tour, which included South Salem and Wakabuck. And she remembers her mother feeding, leaving sandwiches out and things, and things to drink for the leather man when he came by. He would knock on the drain pipe. Her mom would come to the door with something for him to eat. Uh, mainly, where she's remembered as a teacher of young children. She started her teaching career about 1922, but before that, when she got out of school, she worked for the A.G. Spalding Sporting Equipment Company in New York City. She worked there for 15 years, but in 1922, her mother died and she came back to South Salem to take care, to uh, take over, uh, uh, well, to care for her mother and when she died, to uh, go on living in the house, which she did for many, many years until it got too big, too much to take care of. And she and her brother Les, both of them, she a spinster, he a bachelor, moved to Stewart Road. While she was living on the, farm, on the farmhouse on Boughton Road, she started a nursery school. She kept that nursery school for 44 years, retiring when she was 96 years old. 
incredible, incredible. Uh, but anybody who was taught by Louise Boughton remembers to put their rubbers and their boots on in wet weather, wear their mittens and their scarves and their hats when it gets cold in the winter. She was an old fashioned teacher who taught the children with love and kindness, grace and authority. She ran at, at one point two different sessions. She was so popular. Uh, at least for at least one year, she had 59 children in her nursery school. In her later years, it had kind of dwindled to maybe uh, 15 or 20. There are a lot of children in their 70s and, well, probably from their 50s to their 70s, their 80s, who remember being taught by Louise Boughton. She is another of our Lewisboro ladies and um, she, as I said, brought us into the, a little further into the 20th century. So there you have the first of our Lewisboro ladies of note. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the town of Lewisboro to my newly refurbished office. The office was painted, the floors were scraped and refinished, and this whole project was done by Patrick Bates of Vista Boy Scout Troop, I think number one. Uh, and it was his Eagle Project. He had the help of several fathers and, and other scouts. And in just about two weeks, in January, they created a wonderful new home for my artifacts and kind of a reception place. So if we want to meet and talk about history, this is the place to come. I'm going to show you some of the artifacts that have been returned to the house by, by Mrs. Poor's grandchildren, Francine Gaines and her sister Betsy and her several brothers. Uh, the children were most happy to give them back to the farm and they are resting here. They're much happier. I know they feel happy being back where they spent a lot of years. So we're going to start with the, uh, the display case. And in the display case, we will find uh, everything in the display case came back to the farm. There is, there is a wonderful clock collection. There, is, there are pottery, uh, different types of pottery. There is a, uh, a chamber pot, chamber pot, which is so beautiful. I thought we could use it as a punch bowl. And people said, no, Maureen, you can't use a chamber pot as a punch bowl, even though it's so beautiful. Uh, there are uh, there are a couple of the awards that Mrs. that Mrs. Poor won in there, and uh, just some little items that you would have found on Mrs. Poor's dinner table, uh, perhaps. So we will talk. We will give you a little tour of of the uh, the cabinet, and I do think that some of the clocks probably predate Alice and Walter Poor and probably go back to Edward and Grace Lane, her parents. Uh, there are some carriage clocks in there which would have been probably uh, accompanying them on their tours of Europe. Uh, also, we're going to take a look at something that came from the farm that was working here, that use, was used here on the farm in the at least until the 1940s. It's called a root cutter, and it's, it was uh, from the 19, 1880s, but it still works today. Then we'll cut to the, uh, the fireplace and some more artifacts that were given back to the farm by, by the families. And a couple of um, the rocking chairs that you see around all came from the poor family. Now, I don't think I mentioned what this room was used for before uh, the town got the farm from Mrs. Poor. This, they tell me, was the music room. And I can't quite imagine a baby grand in here, but that's what I've been told. There was a piano and it was also the library. Thank you for listening today. You're watching Lewisboro Community Television, Channel 20.